It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. In the United Arab Emirates, people are disappearing at an alarming rate. Not through some science fiction means, but through someone acting with state consent and authority, where individuals are grabbed from the street or from their homes, and then officials deny or refuse to say where they are. It is a crime under international law. This is all happening in conjunction with the disturbing increase in prosecutions of individuals under the Cybercrime Act for their social media posts. A report released by the Emirates Media and Studies Center has concluded that there has been at least 300 prosecutions for so-called cyber crimes in the UAE. This is just in 2016 alone. Joining us today from London to discuss the increasingly oppressive environment in the real world for online activity is Joe Odell. Joe is press officer for the International Campaign for Freedom in the UAE. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Thank you, Aaron. Well, happy to be here. Joe, um, let's start off by you describing for us the cyber law that is being used to prosecute people uh, in the UAE for their basically what we would consider here free speech. Mm. Well, it was a it was a law that was instituted in 2012 by the UAE authorities. Um, they instituted it. Uh, they claim that it's kind of been instituted to re respect privacy, uh, to you know fight fraud, um, to uh, guard against kind of personal hacking attacks and so forth. Uh, but when you look at the, dec the decree, it's kind of vaguely worded. Uh, provisions really provide essentially a kind of legal basis, if you will, for heavy restrictions on freedom of, uh, on freedom of speech and assembly, and essentially really the repression of uh, political distance and government critics, which we've seen at an alarming rate uh, since the institution of this law in 2012. And as I understand it, Joe, people are being targeted for social media posts that they mm. may have actually uh, done outside of the UAE. Is that yes. correct? Yes, um, and there have been cases of that. I mean, earlier this, early uh, in 2014, uh, Jorda uh, the Jord uh, Jordanian journalist uh, Tassia Al Najjar um, tweeted, uh, published a series of Facebook posts. Uh, criticizing the Israeli invasion of the Gaza Strip uh, and criticizing various Arab leaders, including the United Arab Emirates regime, for not doing enough to support uh, the Palestinians. That post was made when he was in Jordan in 2014. In 2015, he moved to the UAE to start, uh, to start working as a reporter. He was then detained by authorities. Uh, he was disappeared for a period, well, for over a year, and he was eventually charged for those Facebook posts and sentenced in March of this year to three years in prison. Um, yes, and sorry. how does the law allow them to do that, something that was actually done outside of the UAE? Well, this is it. And this is, the, you know, this comes back to the vagueness of the law, you know, in itself. Um, it's, uh, it's not clear. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't stipulate really that, you know, these, the, 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 these posts that you have to be in the UAE uh, when you make these posts, it can be done outside. There was, there's another example of it um, with an American citizen, a US citizen who was working for an Emirati company, uh, Ryan Pate, who in 2015 uh, posted on Facebook his uh, grievances with the company. Uh, he then came back to the UAE to carry on working for them and he was detained. Um, uh, four posts that he made in Florida. Um, so, as I say, yeah, it's very vague. It doesn't, uh, it's not clear. Um, and obviously, this leads to extrajudicial uh, proceedings going on in relation to it. What are uh, some of the issues that uh, people may be uh, uh, talking about in social media that seems to be offending the state the most? Uh, I think they obviously issues around. So, it, it, I mean, it's primary. They're pri this is primarily aimed at. I mean, this is part of a, really a wider crackdown in the UAE. 
I mean, it shouldn't be understood in isolation. I mean, since the Arab uprisings in 2011, uh, state repression in the UAE has got increasingly more kind of coercive. Uh, this happened in with a, a group of uh, activists uh, uh, launched a petition calling for democratic reforms. Um, the result of that is, is, was that 64 were then uh, incarcerated. Um, and these, this, this kind of law came in after that. Um, it's primarily really designed to, to, to silence really criticism of the state, essentially, and silence the work of uh, human rights activists. Uh, currently, uh, the very, very prominent human rights activist, Ahmad Mansour, um, who in 2015 won the Martin Ennels Awards for Human Rights Defenders, which is I, essentially kind of like the UN uh, Nobel Peace Prize for human rights activists. Um, he was detained, well, forcefully disappeared earlier this year um, in relation to his social media posts. Um, and it's ironic because what he was campaigning about in the UAE were restrictions around social media, and now he has been forcefully disappeared as a result of his social media activity. Right. Um, so obviously, so, Joe, you're working on this case. What are some of the other mm -hmm. cases that uh, you're working on regarding disappearances or enforced disappearances, I should mm -hmm. say, um, and the use of cybercrime laws in the UAE? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, this is so, you know, there are other cases. Uh, well, they, they, I mean, there are so many cases in which this has happened. Um, we have earlier this year the, the uh, prominent Emirati academic uh, Dr. Nasser bin Gaith was uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison for Twitter comments that were critical of the UAE authorities. Um, he was, prior to that, he was forcefully disappeared for around a period of eight months, uh, a period of which he maintains he was tortured. Uh, subsequently, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch have launched international campaigns calling for his immediate and unconditional release. He's launched a hunger strike. Um, so there are, you know, there are a kind of, there are so many examples of this, uh, but it's it's important to understand it within a wider context of repression in the UAE, and it's important, I think, to understand it within the wider Middle East in terms of, and it, the links that that has uh, in terms of arms exports to the Middle East. So we had the Arab uprisings in 2011. Uh, a lot of people, you know, dubbed that the Facebook revolution. Uh, social media was absolutely fundamental to the way people organised uh, and people came out into the streets subsequently um, to call for democ uh, in pro-democracy movements. And it, so regimes are very, very, very quickly caught on, including the UAE, have quickly caught on to the fact that they need to control social media. Right. And <laughs> what can you tell us about the role of foreign governments and corporations in collaborating mm. with the repression in the UAE? OK, so I mean, there was a so BBC report uh, came out uh, uh, about a couple of months ago um, and it uncovered that BAE Systems, so a British weapons manufacturer, were actually exporting weapons, to, uh, so exporting cybersecurity and monitoring technologies to the United Arab Emirates. Um, and, you know, this technology essentially is, facilitates the UAE authorities in kind of surveying and monitoring the population. It encrypts kind of phone communications. It's got voice tracking software. Um, so British companies such as the UAE, uh, Israel are also involved in exporting, uh, tracking and monitoring uh, surveillance software to the UAE. There was a um, breaking story last year that uh, Ahmed Mansour, uh, the human rights defender I mentioned earlier, uh, there was an attempted hacking on his phone, um, uh, which basically was a, it was a text message. And uh, this text message promised to give him information about the conditions of prisoners in the United Arab Emirates. And as he had already been subject to kind of cyber attacks in the past, he was very suspicious. So he passed his phone on to uh, an organization called Citizen Lab in Toronto, who then tr managed to track, well, found there had been an attempted, uh, an attempted attack on his phone, managed to track it to an Israeli company uh, called the NOS Group. And uh, reportedly, the UAE had paid a million pounds from this Israeli company for the software. Um, so there is a real market 
in terms of cyber security dealers, if you will, um, that is, are facilitating this repression. Yes, and we actually did a story uh, about the, the lab you're talking about in Canada, uh, where they did a report on the way in which this technology had been used um, in Mexico uh, okay. to monitor the activities of lawyers, activists, mm. working on the disappearances of the students um, mm. in Mexico. So this is mm. all very interesting. It all comes uh, full circle here mm. um, of how it is uh, being used by states. What can people do if they want to support people who are being targeted? Um, or what can people who think they are being targeted uh, do if they suspect their, that their phone or their messages are being tampered with? Well, I mean, that, yes, I've not, that's a... It, because of the nature of obviously the surveillance state in the United Arab Emirates, it's very, very difficult if you're in the UAE to counter these attacks by the government. I mean, what uh, Ahmed Mansour uh, did was absolutely paramount um, in uncovering, it, well, in exposing uh, the nature of these attacks and actually led Apple to to um, led Apple to, to do a, a software update to get rid of the. Uh, that get rid of the faults on the phone that enabled the attack. Um, well, you know, what people can do is, is follow follow Ahmed's lead and stay in communication with groups like Citizens Lab. Um, in the UK and in the US, uh, what you know what people can do is to pressure their governments really to stop selling this kind of software and stop allowing British and American companies. Uh, the, to export this software to regimes around the world that routinely uh, violate international human rights law. Um, and so it's absolutely, it's, it's important to realize that it, the, certainly the British state is absolutely complicit in human rights violations if it is allowing the export of this cybersecurity software um, in the UAE, so it's up to uh, it's up to people in the West to put pressure on their governments in order to stop these exports. Yes, Joe, it's a very interesting situation because countries like Canada, the UK, US, of course, call out to nations like the UAE for the violations of human rights in their country. But at the same time, they provide them the technologies, the weaponry, and even training and assistance to carry out these human rights violations. An interesting mm. predicament. It is. It certainly is, yes. I thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you very much. Glad to be here. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network. Yeah.